uh, within the last decade, um, deep learning algorithms um, based on artificial neural network has have achieved um, very impressive results uh, in solving difficult tasks that previously uh, only humans could solve. And the artificial neural networks, although they are inspired by the computations in, of the brain, they differed from biological neural networks in many different aspects. Nevertheless, thanks to success of uh, deep learning, many neuroscientists have uh, asked a question whether neural networks could be a useful framework for understanding biological brain. And um, today I would like to follow um, along these questions and um, describe um, mathematical models uh, of um, neural networks in the brain that can learn uh, as efficiently as artificial neural networks. So I will uh, start with a, a review of artificial neural networks. Um, then I will um, propose how um, similar computation could be approximated in a biologically plausible way, uh, and then um, relate the resulting models with um, um, biological neural networks. And um, um, we have this amazing opportunity to have in-person seminars so if anything is unclear or if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please feel free to interrupt at any time. So artificial neural networks are algorithms which are inspired by, um, by the brain. And uh, an artificial neural network consists of uh, set of nodes, which are represented here by circles, uh, uh, to which I will refer as neurons. And these neurons are um, located in layers. So here we have three layers, uh, an input layer, an output layer, and a hidden layer. Um, and um, each of the nodes receives input from all the nodes from the previous layers. And these inputs are represented by green arrows. And these inputs are weighted. Um, so th there's a kind of a parameter associated with each uh, connection, which describes the weight of this connection or the influence of one neuron uh, on the activity of another neuron. And essentially, the function of, uh, of each of this, uh, of this neuron is to compute a weighted sum of its inputs. And the knowledge of the network is stored in these weight parameters. Uh, so these artificial neural networks can be trained to produce a particular output for particular input. And these uh, neural networks are typically used for classification problem. And I, I, let me just give you an example of a problem of recognizing handwritten digits. Uh, so in this case, um, uh, the input layer will have as many neurons, as many pixels are there in the images which we classify. And an output layer uh, will have as many neurons, as many classes we can have. So, um, for example, um, uh, so for this picture, you, you, you can um, provide, you can set the, the, the values of the input neurons to the brightness of the two first pixels, and then you will do it for all the other input neurons. And uh, we want um, this particular input to produce an output where uh, this neuron corresponding to class number two is... Uh, active while all other neurons are inactive. And um, the, uh, during such um, um, artificial neural networks can be trained where we present such training patterns, which are the pairs of input and output, and we modify the weight parameters in a way which I will describe in detail in a moment. So these artificial neural networks uh, are actually quite old. So the, the kind of the famous paper popularizing them appeared in uh, 1986, but they were already known in the 70s of the, of the last century. Uh, but at the time, um, the computers were not sufficiently powerful to really take advantage of, of um, this technology. And only in the recent uh, decade, people realized that when you train uh, these networks on really large data sets, they can achieve amazing performance in difficult tasks, which uh, as I mentioned, are uh, previously were thought to require human intelligence. So, for example, an influential paper um, um, trained artificial neural network to recognize images. And in this study, a much bigger neural network was trained, and it was trained on 
uh, over a million images which belonged to thousand classes. Uh, and uh, this is a very large amount of knowledge which can be kind of incorporated in this network. And this network um, achieved quite remarkable results. So um, accuracy on the test sets, so on the different images in, on which it was trained was uh, six, uh, above 62%. And this is pretty remarkable because there was 1,000 classes. So the chance performance corresponds just to one over 1,000. Yeah? Uh, and this, was much uh, this, this accuracy was much higher than any other um, algorithm at the time. And you can see um, examples of um, performance of this, of this uh, um, neural network on uh, sample um, test images. So you can see images here. And here you can see the activity levels of five most, output, mo most active output nodes. And um, basically the pink corresponds to the correct answer, right? So the top row, uh, for example, uh, corresponds to the images which were classified correctly, while the uh, bottom row corresponds to errors. But if you look at these errors, they are actually uh, not so bad, right? And, and um, in fact, uh, when, you, uh, when the authors looked at the um, fraction of test images in which the correct answer was among the top five guesses, the accuracy was even, even higher. And, you know, th th uh, so this is just was the kind of like the first uh, highly influential studies, uh, but many studies have then developed and um, um, confirmed the um, accuracy of these deep learning models. And, um, because of the success of artificial neural network, uh, neuroscientists started to uh, get interested in artificial neural networks again and ask if something like, uh, something like this can be used as a model to understand a biological brain. Um, so uh, this uh, figure compares the organization of visual uh, system in the brain with artificial neural network. So, uh, and you can say that there's some kind of like a, uh, high level similarity. So uh, here you can see um, a diagram of monkey brain and color coded are different visual areas involved in identification of an uh, object. Um, so while monkey uh, perceives an image, the information from the retina goes through a number of um, um, areas, um, including the retina, um, subcortical areas, and then different regions of the cortex so the, so the early visual areas are typically numbered V1, V2, V3, and so on, and high uh, level areas. Uh, so, so you have this kind of uh, ser serial propagation of information to a number of, of regions. And in artificial neural network, also the image is propagated through number of layers. So the first layer, second layer, third layer, and so on. So uh, um, several neuroscientists asked, whether you can actually um, see any similarities between these different layers of artificial neural networks trained to recognize images uh, or and brain areas. Um, and, uh, and this is actually the, the, the first study which, which was uh, doing this investigation. So in this experiment, a um, um, series of images was shown to both humans in brain scanner uh, where the activity of different brain regions could be measured or uh, groups, groups of neurons in different brain regions uh, could be measured and to an artificial neural network trained to recognize images. So this was a highly uh, trained seven layer artificial neural network. Uh, and then um, what the authors did, they quantified the similarity between the pattern of activity in a neurons in a particular area of human brain and neurons in a particular layer of artificial neural network. And uh, uh, you can see that there is some kind of similarity. And furthermore, the similarity uh, has this, this structure that if you look at the um, similarity with these early visual areas, which are just kind of, um, which, which are the first areas of the cortex which get the image, uh, their pattern of activity is most similar with the early layers of these artificial neural networks. By contrast, uh, the activity in the higher visual areas is most similar uh, with activities of the last layers of the uh, uh, artificial neural network. Okay, so uh, yes? Same, same, same 
Yes, so I have a backup slide. <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 yeah, so this is actually quite clever way how, how you get this kind of similarity because it's not obvious because, of course, you don't expect that the representation of the image in artificial neural network would be exactly the same as the brain because there's many ways of representing the images. So the way you do this is, for example, let's say that you are looking at similarity between particular uh, uh, area of the brain, let's say V1 or primary visual cortex, and particular layer of neural network. So um, usually from, uh, from a brain scanner, from a given area, you can uh, read activity of several so-called voxels, which is like small regions of the brain tissue. Uh, and let's say that you have hundreds of voxels uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this brain area. So for each image, you can get a pattern, which is a vector of 100 numbers. And then you can do the same for artificial neural network. It's very easy. Uh, you just have a vector which is as long as the um, as the number of uh, neurons in a particular layer. Yes. So you have this kind of vectors which are the representation of um, um, of uh, of particular image. Yes. So now you can then create a similarity matrix where uh, you take all your images and for every image you calculate the correlation between uh, the uh, representation uh, of this image of this image and every other image so for example this is um, um, the, the similarity matrix for for the brain area which is the kind of high late in the visual hierarchy um, and um, and you can see that there are some some images which have all the faces have very similar patterns of response um, while the faces are maybe very different than um, natural images uh, and so on. And then you can create a similar uh, matrix for um, uh, artificial neural network. And then what you then do, uh, you essentially calculate a similarity between these two matrices. Okay. So by how similar uh, human view images is being written, how similar the uh, layer Yes. Yes, exactly. So then you can calculate the similarity measure for each layer between each layer in each brain area, and then you can kind of find the correspondence between them. Okay. Um, so, so this is very optimistic. However, there are some uh, uh, pro problems and the, the, uh, and the artificial neural networks have been criticized um, or the biological plausibility have been criticized from um, early on. So there was, a, for example, a very uh, famous article written by Francis Crick who uh, discovered uh, DNA and then later in life kind of uh, got interested in neuroscience. And essentially he uh, pointed several shortcomings of uh, uh, neural networks artificial neural networks. And I, I think that the most uh, important one uh, is that the learning rule in artificial neural networks is completely unrealistic. So what happens is that in this artificial neural networks, the weight modification depends on a particular term, which is called the error term. And I will, I will go through the details of the algorithm in the moment. And this error term is computed by an external program that simulates the, the network rather than the, by the network itself, right? So there's some kind of like an external agent which looks at the network, does some computation, and then figures out how to update the weights. By contrast, in biological neural networks, uh, the synaptic weights can only be modified on the, on the basis of activity of the two neurons that synapse connects. Yes? So, so, and I will try to address how this, this problem um, with this learning rule can be uh, addressed in a moment. Okay, so let me now go over the details of the um, main algorithm used to train artificial neural networks, which is called backpropagation algorithm. Um, so let me first introduce the notation um, I will use um, with artificial neural networks. So, so um, I will denote the inputs to neurons by Y, and I, uh, the superscript will denote the layer. So this is the first layer, second layer, and third layer. And the subscript will denote the neuron within the layer. Um, and then I will denote the weights of the connections by W. Uh, and again, uh, here we have the uh, layer, and then uh, I and J are the indices of, of, the, of the neurons the weights connect. And I will kind of follow the um, convention um, which is used in, in, um, in this field, 
where the first index actually is the number of the target neuron and the second index of the source neuron, yes? Um, so input to each neuron is a sum of the activities of neurons from the previous layer weighted by the strength of the connections, yes? And uh, we assume that the activity of a neuron uh, is a nonlinear function of its input, and this nonlinear function here is uh, given by uh, f. Yeah, so the f is typically some kind of nonlinear function, like sigmoidal function, which prevents neurons from having no negative or infinite um, uh, activity levels. Um, and input to each neuron. Just a second, I will just. Yes, and input to each neuron. Uh, it's a weighted sum of, uh, of the activity of, in the previous layer. Um, so during training, we'll provide the input and output patterns, which I will denote by S in and S out. And um, learning is aimed at minimizing the error made by the network. So the error, uh, which I will denote by E, is defined in this equation, which is essentially the difference between the desired output and the output produced by the network. And this, uh, this difference is squared and summed across all the neurons uh, in the output layer. Um, and during learning, the weights um, are modified um, in a way which minimizes this error. So we change the weights in the direction opposite to the gradient of, uh, of this error function over the weight. So we essentially change the weights to minimize the error. And if you evaluate this gradient, uh, you will end up with a very uh, elegant rule for weight modification. So it turns out the weight modification um, is proportional to activity of a presynaptic neuron and the error term calculated with a postsynaptic neuron. So these error terms are denoted by delta and they are defined in this way. So for the output layer, the error term is just a difference between the desired activity and the activity actually produced by the network. While for these hidden layers, um, the error stems turn out to be um, that they can be computed recursively from the errors in the layer above. And here you can see the biggest problem with, with this network, that the errors are not computed by the network themselves. So, so there is no node in the network which represents these errors. These errors are computed by a computer program which simulates the network. And, uh, and of course, something like this cannot happen in the, in the real brain. So this is the kind of cri criticism of, of this model. Uh, any questions about this? Yes. I have a question why the real brain doesn't do that much with the environment. Okay, that's a, that's a great uh, question. So the, the problem is that this error term it's not just one global signal which tells you whether your movement was good or not. You have an error signal associated with every neuron. So for every neuron in the network, you have to calculate a separate error term. And, uh, and the way to think about these error terms, this error term for each neuron tells you how the activity of these neurons should change to minimize the total error on the output. So mm -hmm. that's uh, Yes. Right. So the same computer program calculates the forward propagation and the backward uh, propagation uh, function of the neurons. Mm -hmm. The real objection here is that those neurons don't look like biological neurons, that one should just come out and say that. Well, so there's several objections, uh, and this is the second objection of Craig. I mean, he listed several objections, but I think that this, this one is, is a smaller objection because you can always say that this is an approximation of a real neuron that, you know, uh, my, um, this equation is an approximation of a real neuron. By contrast, uh, when the, this plasticity rule, in my opinion, is the biggest weakness of artificial neural networks because you really need some kind of external agent to... Um, that seems like an incoherent um, mm -hmm. uh, statement given the whole uh, network is artificial and simulated on a computer. But yes. what is ascribed to the neuron purely a matter of uh, opinion. It's not anything that has any external reality. If it's going to be given external reality, 
it has to be with respect to some model of yeah, yes. So, so I agree. So, from from computer science point of view, of course, it, it's. A, but if you now look at uh, now from the pers perspective of these neuroscientists who really actually try to map these neurons on the real brain, they now start to think about these artificial neurons as models of biological neurons. Uh, well, <laughs> well. So I. Okay. So uh, I will show. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, so basically, just to to, to give you a spoiler, uh, in the original backpropagation, indeed, uh, all these errors are not locally propagated. But I will show you in uh, like five minutes another network which does exactly the same cal calculation with the local propagation of error. Okay, so let me now. Uh, um, give you some uh, into, um, kind of intuition uh, for how this uh, artificial neural network works. And this is a very nice uh, example um, animation made by uh, my former student, James Whittington. And by the way, uh, the work which I will present is, is actually uh, work together with him. Um, so in this cartoon, uh, again, we will, I will denote the neurons with circles and the color denotes the level of activity. So the red is high activity, white is zero activity. Um, this okay. Um, these small uh, squares just indicate where the nonlinear operation F is applied. So, but, but essentially, this is a small detail which you can uh, ignore. Um, and um, um, thickness of arrows denotes the strength of the connections. So, in this network, for example, we consider a network. Just a second. Arrows visible. You consider a network where there's strong connection here, here, and here, and all the other connections are essentially weak. Um, so let us now see what happens in this network when we provide this particular input pattern. So essentially we set the input layer to the input pattern, and then we propagate activity. And uh, the activity propagates through the network, and you can, you can see what happens, it uh, pro propagates propagates through um, uh, this strong connection. So we have uh, output activity here, but not here because these connections are weak. So now consider what happens when we provide this training uh, output pattern. So we want network to produce a different pattern of activity in which both neurons are active. Yes? So, uh, so here by triangles, I denote that this error term is delta. Yes? So this error term is high because uh, the target pattern, the target activity is much larger than the uh, produce activity. By contrast, this error is much lower because the target is very close to the produce activity. And then you can also see the, um, the other errors, which um, you know, can be calculated through this back propagation of error. So, so this one is high because it's kind of back propagated here. And the green arrows show the weights which are modified according to the back propagation algorithm. So according to the back propagation algorithm, we will increase two weights, this one and this one. And these are the weights between active presynaptic neurons and the postsynaptic neurons which have high error. So there's high error here and high error here. That's why these two weights are increased. And you can see that indeed, if you increase these two weights, you will be now able to propagate this activity to this node. So, so that the total error will be reduced. Okay, so, um, so now, um, as I mentioned, uh, um, we are very much interested in trying to figure out how you can design a network which where the errors will be actually physically propagated in the network itself. And um, we, um, even before I started this work, I was interested uh, in a very interesting model of information processing in the brain called predictive coding, which is also a very old model um, uh, developed in the 90s by Ryan Ballard. Um, and this, no, this model includes um, neurons which encode errors. I will just uh, give you a um, description of how it works in, in detail. Um, and uh, essentially, this model has been developed to describe unsupervised learning in the visual cortex. So, so just how the brain builds some kind of representation of visual stimuli. 
and it actually has been quite intensively used to, to, to describe this learning. But uh, with my student, James Whittington, we noticed that actually if you take this model and instead of using it for unsupervised learning, use it for supervised learning, then this model very closely approximates error back propagation, but does it in a kind of um, way where the errors are computed in the network themselves. Okay. So let me just explain um, the notation um, uh, which I will uh, use in the, in the graphs illustrating this network. Um, so the, I will denote the activity of uh, neurons by X, and this kind of corresponds to Y in my artificial neural networks. I will denote the activity, there's something strange going on with the, Um, the activity of error nodes by epsilon, which kind of corresponds to delta in the previous network, and the weights will be V, which corresponds to W in my previous notation for artificial neural network. And uh, this kind of green double connection um, denote all to all connection. So basically, all these neurons get an input from all uh, these neurons, while these black connections correspond to one-to-one -to -one connection. So, so basically there's just uh, um, neuron number one in this layer gets input from neuron number one in this layer. And arrows denote excitatory connections, so, so the, the, you know, just normal connections, while the lines ending with circle denote so-called inhibitory connections. So basically these, are, these connections have uh, a minus sign in front of them. So, so um, just be, before going through a mathematical description of this predictive coding network, uh, let me just uh, say kind of overview how it works. So it has this uh, remarkable property that when you present this network just with the input pattern, so if you just uh, constrain on the one end of this network, uh, the network computes the output in exactly the same way as artificial neural network with the same weight. So it performs exactly the same computation um, as artificial neural network. By contrast, when you um, present it with both input and output, uh, the weights are updated in a very similar way uh, as in the backpropagation algorithm. And what's kind of remarkable about this, this network is that it doesn't require any external control. What, uh, uh, it basically, you can only control this network by providing uh, inputs. If you just provide the input on one side, it will just propagate the input. If you provide the input on both sides, uh, it will essentially uh, learn. Okay, so let me just now go through a, uh, through a details, um, um, the detailed description of this, of this network. And let's start with the error nodes. So this error nodes uh, compute the difference between the actual activity of the corresponding nodes and the prediction based on the previous layer. So the prediction um, for activity of a neuron, I will, I will denote by mu, and it's defined in this equation. So it's basically the prediction for activity of neuron I in layer L is just the weighted sum of the activity of neurons in the previous layer. So basically it's equivalent to the information propagated in artificial neural network. So this error nodes compute the difference between the actual activity of a node and the prediction uh, from the previous layer. Um, and of course, this computation can be easily implemented in, in this network where you have excitatory projection here corresponding to this term and inhibitory projection from all the neurons in the previous layer corresponding to this term. Now, how the blue nodes are uh, modified in this network? So, so the blue nodes are the kind of the, the most important nodes which encode the, the, the values um, computed by this network. So you modify this, uh, this value nodes to minimize a global error function. And this global error function um, is denoted here by F, and it's a sum of all errors in the network, yes? So uh, it differs from the error function in the artificial neural network, which was defined just as sum of errors in the output layer. Here, the error function is defined as the sum of all errors in all the layers. And essentially, um, in this predictive coding um, network, you do not uh, describe um, you do not have like a simple rule to, uh, for, uh, for the um, activity of this node X, but instead you describe it as a kind of like a dynamical system. By, you describe it by a differential equation, which, uh, which basically 
says that you will change the activity of this value nodes in order to minimize this total error. So you basically uh, set up this kind of um, dynamical system uh, where the activity of this value nodes changes in a way which will minimize this total error. Yes. And now, if you evaluate this derivative, you end up with relatively simple expression. Um, and um, importantly, this expression can be easily mapped on this network architecture. Yes. So essentially, you, um, the um, activity of each value node will change with a rate proportional to the inhibition from the corresponding error node. So this can be brought here by this connection and excitation from all the error nodes in the layer above, which can be brought by, by these connections. So, so you end up with a really simple system which, um, where all the computations can be uh, implemented in this very simple network. So let me now um, give you an example of how this network works. So, so now there's another animation made by James. Um, where um, now I'm presenting a predictive coding network, which is equivalent to the artificial neural network, which I was presenting before. So again, we have a, um, strong connections here, here, and here, and weak connections everywhere else. And I'm um, setting the input layer to the same input pattern as before. And initially, there is an error um, for uh, for this neuron. So this actually activity of this neuron is negative because it gets inhibition from, um, from this input neuron and no excitation from this input neuron. And now let me just show you how the activity of the nodes changes uh, while the network relaxes. So you can see that this activity is um, essentially propagated uh, because you have kind of like double inhibitory connection and inhibition of inhibition essentially gives you excitation, right? And, um, so, and what's happening is that um, you, you remember that initially this neuron was, um, was inhibited. So it was kind of releasing from inhibition, this neuron, and this neuron gradually was increasing its activity until a point where the feedback sent here was balancing this input and this act activity of all these neurons decreased to zero. So let me just show you this once again. So essentially the activity is propagated in this, in this network and during this propagation, all the error nodes converge to zero. Yes. Yes. So this is a great question. At this point, it's completely not intuitive why it is. But in three slides, I will try to argue that these errors are actually very closely related to errors in the propagation. Yeah. So, so just uh, this is key question. This is actually the key question which I will try to, to argue. Um, so, but maybe before we, we look at what happens during training, um, let me just uh, say, you know, why the network produces exactly the same uh, um, output as artificial neural network. So as you could see in the simulation, all the errors converge to zero. Um, and it happened because I just constrained uh, the input layer. I didn't constrain the output layer. So, the, so there was a lot of freedom in the system and all the neurons were able to converge to, to values where the predicted activity is equal to actual activity of the neurons. And if this is the case, the activity of each neuron was equal to the weighted sum of inputs, which is exactly the same rule as in artificial neural network. So the, the network propagates information in exactly the same way as in the artificial neural network. Now, the key point is what happens during the training. Yes? So when you it turns out that when you now constrain both ends of this network, the network has no longer freedom for the error nodes to converge to zero. So errors will converge to some other values, may converge to some other values. And, um, and as I will show you in a moment, they actually converge to values very similar as in uh, error back propagation. Uh, and once the errors converge, you modify the weights. And in the predictive coding model, you modify the weights uh, to minimize this global error. Um, so again, you modify um, it in proportion, on, uh, in proportion to the uh, negative gradient of this global error. And now if you evaluate this gradient, you get, uh, update rule, which is essentially 
analogous to that in the um, artificial neural network. It's the activity of presynaptic node and the error node. But now the key point is that in this predictive coding network, this is the activity of presynaptic neuron times the activity of postsynaptic neuron. So, the, so this weight modification is now local to the synapse. It's just the product of activity of the two neurons it connects. And it's, in the neuroscience, it's known as Hebbian plasticity. And this is the kind of type of plasticity which has been many times observed uh, between real neurons. Um, so now let me just um, show you what happens in this network when you uh, constrain uh, both ends. So now I'm presenting the same input pattern and the same output pattern which I was presenting for artificial neural network. And let me now um, run a little simulation and see, see to what values the network converges. So, um, so now you can see that the errors, um, error nodes have very similar values as the error terms in artificial neural networks. So in particular, um, you know, there's a high error here. And um, because, you know, this, um, and there's a difference between the propagated activity and the desired activity, while the error here is much lower. And uh, you may remember that there was a very similar pattern of errors in artificial neural network. And then the weights are updated and the weights are updated between coactive neurons. And here uh, it corresponds to the largest increase in this weight and in this weight. And these were exactly the same weights which were updated in artificial neural network. And then I can even show you both uh, diagrams at the same time so they can be compared. So the key similarity is that the same weights have the largest increase in both models. And, but the weight and, but the weight updates are not exactly the same. Um, and, um, and for example, you can see that in the predictive coding network, also this weight is increased, while in artificial neural network, it is not. And um, this happens because in predictive coding network, while the network relaxes during the propagation of these errors, the activity of, um, of some of the hidden nodes changes. So for example, this node now increases activity while the error was propagated because it took part in the propagation of error. Um, but if you look at this, just a second. If you look at this diagram, actually you can see that increasing this weight also makes sense because if you uh, increase this weight, then increasing this weight will help you to propagate information through this road. So I, although the weight, uh, weight update is not exactly the same as in um, artificial neural network, it also makes sense. And um, another thing to point out is that the, the activity of these error terms in the predictive coding network has very similar values as activity of error terms in the artificial neural network. So let me now um, show you um, why this is the case. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to say about that output. Right? So, uh, so uh, you're, yes. making, you're making a bet that the, uh, the activity during settling right, is somehow right in a way that this network, which has a better global picture yes. of the data, doesn't know about. Right? So, that's um, yeah, it's a dubious bet. Right? Uh, maybe it turns out to be right, but it's, uh, I, I, it's not so easy to defend that point, I think. Yes, so I think that this is a key question which we are working on at the moment. Yes, is this bad, dubious, or actually is it a useful thing to do? And, and I don't know at the moment. Yes. Yes, so I think, and I think this is a key open question, and uh, I'm unable to, to give a definite answer to this. It's a, it's a key, key question. Um, so now, why the errors are the same in the... Um, or very similar in the two, two models. So we can, we, we, could, we could already see this in the simulation, but we can also see this by looking at the equation of this predictive coding model. So, um, so here for, for, for a reminder, I'm showing you the equation that's defining the error terms in backpropagation algorithm. And so let's consider first the case of the last layer. So in the predictive coding model, the error in the last layer is just the difference between the output and the prediction from the previous layer. Yes? 
And uh, during training, this output is set to the training example. So essentially, this is the training example. And this is prediction of the output from the previous layer. So it's a very similar term to this term. It's not exactly the, the same, because in predictive coding networks, while you propagate the errors, the activity of this uh, hidden neurons change. But it's, it's a kind of, you can see that it's a related term. Now, remarkably, the relationship between the errors in one layer and the errors in the previous layer is exactly the same in predictive coding as in artificial neural networks. So the errors are back propagated in exactly the same way. And then to notice this, you can look at the equation describing the dynamics of this value nodes in predictive coding network. And now um, to understand to what values um, it converges, we can look at the values uh, at the equilibrium. So at the equilibrium, the rate of change must be zero. So if you set this to zero, now you move this error on the other side, you get this relationship between the errors in layer L and the errors in layer L plus one. And this relationship is exactly the same as in backpropagation algorithm. So, so you can see that in this predictive coding network, errors are backpropagated in a very similar way, or so in exactly the same way as in artificial neural network. But uh, the, the, back, the predictive coding um, network uses only local synaptic plasticity. So on the basis of this, we thought that um, um, this network can also should be able to achieve very similar performance. So James tested the performance of this network on a standard benchmark, uh, machine learning benchmark called MNIST dataset, which is a dataset uh, for recognition of handwritten digits. So it consists of many examples of different digits belonging to 10 classes. Uh, so James uh, trained uh, um, both artificial neural network and predictive coding network on this problem. So the network So the network had you know, as many inputs, as many pixels in these images. Um, there was um, um, 10 outputs and two hidden layers. And here you can see the performance of artificial neural network in black and predictive coding network in red. Uh, here you can see the performance in the training set and testing set as a function of number of training epochs. And you can see that the networks perform in a very, very similar way. So, uh, so which is kind of uh, showing that this predictive coding networks could achieve exactly the same or uh, equally good learning performance as artificial neural network without, uh, you know, this, uh, with, with just propagating and, and errors locally and updating weights locally. Yeah? So, so this kind of gives you a hope that you can build similar uh, neural networks in the brain or there are similar neural networks in the brain, which also, uh, you know, propagate this activity uh, locally. Um, oh, yes. For the outer layer, we have the bond for the, for the middle layer, what's the bond for the, for the additional? Yes, the, the thing is that we don't have a ground truth, yes. And what, what happens in this predictive coding networks um, is that once you, you know, set the input layer and output layer, it tries to find the values of these hidden units, which will minimize this uh, total error. So, so, so basically, the, 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 all these kind of hidden units go some kind of relaxation uh, process where they converge to the values in which the total error in the network will be, will be minimized. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting that, and this is the whole, the, the whole point, and, and, and this is actually not unique to, um, um, to this predictive coding network, in artificial neural network, you also are able to learn without having a grand truth uh, for, um, for the hidden, hidden units. And the rules are different because, you know, here we, have, uh, we are just finding these hidden units which will kind of minimize the, the, the total error through doing this kind of relaxation process. In artificial neural networks, there's, there's some kind of other rule for, for finding these desired values of, 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 of hidden layers, or actually you don't even find them explicitly. Um, yeah, you can, you can say that in predictive coding networks, the network finds this, uh, this desired values explicitly, while in artificial neural network, there's no kind of explicit state of finding these desired values. Yes? So you, you said that propagating backwards a common error, that is a back propagation of a deep neural network, mm -hmm. you are having, you are having forward backward propagation of local error. 
So that's yes. forward, backward at the local level. Exactly. That's, that's, that's the very good way of looking at this. Yes. Uh, yes. Given that you're doing local propagation uh, through the layers, uh, and the networks that you're controlling us are very shallow, uh, is that not kind of a concern that maybe you're just equivalent because you've got a very low number of layers? Um, Whereas if you had a really big <coughs> network with like 30 layers or something, then you see that very different behavior? Yes, so this is a great question. So we haven't really tested this. Uh, I'm not sure what is the deepest predictive coding network my students tested, but probably more than two hidden layers. I think that they went maybe to three, four. Um, but yes, uh, we haven't really quantified uh, um, how this will scale to deeper networks. And I think it's a very important th thing to do. We hope that uh, we have kind of reasons to believe that uh, because of the kind of mathematical similarity of of error propagation, that the rule of propagating error is exactly the same. We hope that this should work for the deeper networks as well, but we haven't quantified it, I have to admit. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so this is actually more biologically plausible though, because you have these backwards connections. Um, is there any you know, biological evidence for these backwards connections? In yes, so in biology, there's always a lot of connections in both directions. Um, so, so for example, the, the, um, um, so I, I think that in this diagram you can see that uh, each between each kind of cortical areas in this vi visual hierarchy you have a lot of connections in both directions. And in fact, we know a lot about the uh, kind of architecture of this connection side. So I maybe skip to one of my later slides, which I wanted to use for some other purposes. So it has to be also said that this is a highly super simplified model. Yes? Cortex has very sophisticated structure. So it's divided into six layers. Uh, so, th so here you can see um, a kind of a diagram uh, illustrating the, the kind of key types of neurons and their connection strength uh, and the correct connection frequency. And <clears throat> so, so, the, so the neurons have been divided into layer two, three, layer four, layer five, excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons. We know how they are connected. And we know that uh, certain neurons get input from the uh, feed forward input from lower areas. Different neurons get a feedback input. And we know which neurons set feed forward input, which neurons set feedback input. So there's a lot of, lot of complexity, uh, which we know. And um, I think that, uh, and so, so, the, so the network structure of the cortex was much, much more complicated than my simple toy model of predictive coding. But I think that, you know, um, I used to say that my goal is that before I retire, it would be nice to be able to map this complicated structure onto the, um, and, uh, this algorithmic description of predictive coding. I mean, I have to say that some attempts of this mapping have been made. So for example, there's one of attempts which tries to map predictive coding on, onto this connectivity. But I think that we are still, this is just one, one candidate, interesting candidate, but still, you know, um, in my opinion, just a candidate. Uh, and uh, still we have a lot of work to do before we can answer um, this kind of question. But, but the key point is that yes, backward connection is just one example, but another, um, um, I think the key point, uh, why I think these predictive coding networks are more biologically plausible than original artificial neural network description, is that they actually have the error nodes which kind of compute these errors locally by pro uh, propagating messages in a way similar to the way neurons propagate messages, rather than the errors being calculated by a, by a computer program. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in terms of in terms of having messages, you know, propagating in, in the brain, we know that neurons are, I mean, because we're talking about biologically intelligent mm -hmm. neurons, right? We know that neurons, they have discrete spikes. Yes. Rather than continuous flow of information, right? How can we? Yes, so this is another uh, simplification, another this kind of uh, false criticism that, uh, you know, uh, these artificial neural networks kind of ignore the fact that neurons produce spikes. They kind of describe the changes in firing rate of the neuron as a function of time. And 
a lot of work has been done on, uh, by other people uh, by trying to think how you can do backprop with spiking neural networks. And there's also a spiking formulation of the predictive coding model. So, so there's, there's a, 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 this is a very interesting question. A lot of people are, are thinking uh, about it. And again, I don't think that there's like a super clear answer, but I think it's, a, it's an active area um, of research. And, um, and also, um, uh, you know, um, synaptic weight modification in the brain is typically described in, in terms of something which is called spike time dependent plasticity. And, and some of this, uh, some different models of biological back, back propagation have been related with different rule of spike time dependent plasticity. And kind of, I, I wrote a review um, titled Theories of Error Back Propagation in the Brain, where we just go over this uh, relationship between spike time dependent plasticity and these different models. And uh, other question? Yes. They're all types of based, Okay, so I, I think um, that um, we wanted to kind of have a simple comparison. And in fact, uh, the simulation, uh, this MNEST simulation, which I was showing, is actually the learning rate is chosen according to Adam uh, procedure. Um, and this is just for comparison because the learning rate in predictive coding network and uh, artificial neural network uh, has a different meaning. So just to, to have a fair comparison, you have to have an objective rule how to choose this uh, learning rate. That's why we use Adam optimizer. And if you are in this field, you know that uh, you know maybe two percent is not an amazing uh, uh, accuracy for for MNEST. And um, but it's of course because we didn't use convolutional neural networks. But again, there is other work which uh, is very easy to generalize, uh, generalize this kind of predictive coding networks to a convolutional set setting, and this has been done by other people. So, um, um, so we used this because we wanted to have like one-to-one -one comparison in the kind of like the simplest possible artificial neural network setting to which we can compare predictive coding networks. But of course, you can extend it to other uh, more realistic settings. Yes. 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 Okay. Another uh, questions? Yes. Yes, that's a, a great question. So I had to look it up uh, in Google. I was very curious myself. I'll just show the slide. Uh, <clears throat> so apparently, according to Google, grill is this thing. And convertible is this the, the kind of car which, with an open roof? Uh, well, so the, so the thing is that uh, that uh, as a <laughs> so these images were some kind of images who, which were classified by someone, yeah. by a human being, and human being just attached some classes to these images, and apparently this was the uh, grill, right? And um, or this is um, a mushroom. I think agaric is. I just look it up again in, in Google. So this is some kind of like type of mushroom with some spots or something. So 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 um, there's a lot of ambiguity of how you can call these different images. And in fact, you can see that this artificial neural network got uh, images uh, not correctly in a way you would expect humans to get them not correctly. Yes, yes. So uh, that's, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I don't know what's that, uh, but it's definitely lower than this one. <laughs> yes. How are you less than 
Yes, probably less, less than less than two percent. Um, okay, another um, question. Yes. sort of takes artificial neural networks very literally, whereas, you know, the brain's a very complex thing. You can imagine all sorts of ways that this sort of back propagation of errors could have, could have been happening. And do you think it was a strong objection to start with? Or? Yeah, I think it was strong objections in mind of uh, kind of computational neuroscientists. And, and essentially, uh, people lost interest in artificial neural networks for the next 30 years. Uh, or 25 years after uh, writing. That was when they were not working. That they were not working, this was one thing, but first they were not working, and secondly, they were biologically implausible. Yes, and... <laughs> yes, yes, so just, just if I may I also add to, so, um, and it's true that probably there is many different ways of, um, um, implementing this um, um, backpropagation in a biologically plausible way. So I try to advertise predictive coding because this is the, the way, um, uh, the model on which we have, uh, my group have worked on, but there's, but several other models have been proposed recently. And I mentioned that I wrote this review, which uh, uh, describes several other models, which also have been proposed. And I will also show you my other favorite model, very briefly. So, Another criticism you can make about this um, um, about this predictive coding network is that it it has this kind of a very unrealistic one to one connection between the error nodes and the this value nodes and such connections don 't exist in the cortex right uh, and um, recently there was a um, um, very interesting um, paper which uh, proposed that maybe the errors are not encoded in separate neurons but encoded in so-called apical dendrites of the pyramidal neurons. So the pyramidal neurons are the kind of the largest neurons in the cortex, and they have this one big dendrite, which actually, so the, all the feed, feedback inputs are um, sent to this higher layer. So this apical dendrite is in a position to kind of calculate the error. And, and they propose that maybe the errors for the neurons are represented in, uh, in this apical dendrites. And, and there was actually a several of models like this. And my favorite model was proposed by Sacramento et al. And then, um, um, and uh, basically with James, again, we looked at the equations of this model and we actually noticed that this model can be rewritten as predictive coding models. So predictive coding equations can be rewritten in a slightly different form and then formulated in a way where, where essentially they would map not on this architecture, but would map on this architecture. So, so basically there's also other ways of mapping this predictive coding models on, on the kind of bio, more biologically realistic um, architectures. Yes. So, uh, deep neural networks are very good at uh, classifying uh, static images, let's say images or uh, static objects. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, using the predictive mo modeling uh, uh, method that you have suggested for time series? And if any, uh, because it seems to be suitable for time series yes. learning uh, over time, learning of sequences. Uh, like uh, videos or like EEG, fMRI data centers, and is there any spiking implementation of this model so far? Uh, so, um, spiking neurons, so yes, so there, there's spiking, very interesting spiking implementation of predictive coding networks, and yeah. it has been developed by um, Sophie Deneff from Paris and Christian Manchin from Lisbon. Um, it's, they haven't um, um, developed in context of supervised learning, they, they did for unsupervised learning, um, so this is, this is a very interesting uh, kind of spiking implementation, which is kind of more suitable for temporal data. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, um, th so this is one, one answer. Um, we also have tried to look at the relationship between predictive coding networks and backprop through time. So this kind of algorithms for, for, for artificial neural networks, which allow you to learn sequences. Um, and, um, um, Yes, it's kind of possible to, to a certain extent to reformulate this algorithm in, a, in this way, but it's, 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 it becomes more complicated. So we haven't published this, this yet, but, but it's also an interesting direction of how would you uh, um, unify uh, this. And um, just if I may just add the last answer. So there's a very interesting work 
um, in terms of like prediction in time of, of um, my colleague uh, from, from Oxford, uh, Andrew King, who is a kind of a neurophysiologist who looks at the uh, properties of um, neurons in primary visual cortex and primary auditory cortex. And these neurons are famously known to encode this kind of edges. But in fact, uh, neurons in, in visual cortex don't really respond to edges, they respond to moving edges. And, uh, and essentially, he demonstrated that you can describe, you can explain a lot of properties of these neurons if you basically train artificial neural network to predict a next frame of the video. Yes, and I, I, I would really like to, uh, you know, um, move it to this setting because I think it's, it's a kind of very interesting setting to, to, to kind of predict the next frame. And I mean, this is, this is how the supervised signals really come in, uh, in the human brain. We don't get like many instructions like in the MNEST uh, data sets. We just uh, see stimuli and they see stimuli in the future. And very often the stimuli in the future are the kind of the, the things which we try to predict. Yes. Yeah, perfectly uh, yeah and, of course. And for that matter, state of the art um, video production. Yes. And uh, video uh, yes. record is all based yes. on the current state of the art. So they're not unsuitable for that. Right? This <laughs> yes. Be suitable yes, that. yes, of course. I mean, I, I, I um, um, yes, uh, I agree. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to ever beat the, uh, in terms of performance or approach the performance, but I think that this, this kind of models provide you kind of a uh, hint in how our brain is able to make these temporal predictions as well. Okay. Other questions? Any more questions live? Any more questions? Oops. Oh, we forgot the chat. Oh. Okay. So there is a question from the chat. Um, is uh, the PC training similarly fast as a backprop algorithm? Okay, so this is a very interesting question which we, which we are thinking about. Um, so you can define speed of training in two ways, in terms of computational time and in terms of sampling efficiency. Yes. Um, So in this example, you can see that uh, you have a number of epochs on the x-axis. So in terms of the um, number of uh, samples and sample efficiency, uh, it was equally fast as um, artificial neural network. Uh, in this particular simulation, uh, the computation time was much slower than artificial neural network. But at this time, we haven't really figured out how to optimize this uh, predictive coding networks. I think uh, now my other student, Yuhang, um, uh, figured out how to kind of optimize the performance of these ne networks so, th so they, we can kind of simulate them uh, almost as quickly as artificial neural networks. 